Good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Our first item of business this morning is a decision on taking items 3, 4, 5 and 6 in private. Item 3 is consideration of the evidence heard on the Land Reform Scotland Bill. Item 4 is the consideration of the recommended candidates for appointment to the Scottish Land Commission. Item 5 is the consideration of the committee's work programme. And item 6 is the consideration of the committee's pre-budget scrutiny letter. Are we all agreed to take these matters in private? We are. Thank you. Our second item is uh, a business this morning is an evidence session on the Land Reform Scotland Bill. Our focus today is part one of the bill and we're joined by a panel of community land stakeholders and I'm pleased to welcome Dr Joss Dobble, the Policy Manager for Community Land Scotland, John Hollingdale who's the Policy Advisor for Scottish Community Alliance and Linda Gillespie who's the Head of Community Ownership Development Trusts Association Scotland. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, Rhoda Grant, who will be joining us uh, remotely. Now, at the start of these uh, sessions, before you may have forgotten, uh, I always like to make a declaration. So I will make the same declaration I've made before. I declare an interest in a farming partnership in Murray as set out in my register of interests. Specifically, I declare an interest as an owner of approximately 500 acres of farmed land, of which 50 acres is woodland. I also declare that I am a tenant of approximately 500 acres in Murray under a non-agricultural tenancy, and that I have another farm tenancy under the Agricultural Holdings Acts 1991. I also declare that I sometimes take grasslets on an annual basis. So all details of my uh, register of interest can be found online, obviously. Now we've allocated uh, about 90 minutes uh, for this uh, session. And as convener, I get to ask the gentle warm-up question at the beginning. And uh, my question is, uh, do you think part one of the land reform bill is uh, the right way to address any perceived problems? And I'm going to go to you, Linda, first, and then to Josh, uh, and then I'll go to John. Linda. I'm glad that's the warm-up question. <laughs> um, I, I think with the scale, as, as within the legislation at the moment, there, it, it, it potentially has a kind of more limited impact than it potentially could have and that actually we would certainly at DTAS be looking to reduce from 3,000 hectares to the 500 hectare mark. I think there's possibly other uh, considerations that could be brought in for urban Scotland because as it stands uh, urban Scotland doesn't feature within the legislation and whether that's where the committee would like to take it. Um, I think there's opportunities for changing the definition round about the land holdings that could do that, that could have a kind of stronger impact on communities. Okay, Josh. Yeah, thanks. First of all, thank you for the invitation to give evidence. Um, and just for background, uh, I'm the policy manager at Community Land Scotland, which is the representative body for Scotland's community landowners. Um, there's now 500 or over 500 community landowners around Scotland, which equates to about 3% of the total land holdings in Scotland. Um, and this is very significant land holdings, you know, entire estates, right down to, you know, communities who own particular <coughs> assets or buildings or bits of green space in, in urban Scotland. Um, in terms of part one of the bill, I suppose we welcome further land reform legislation. Scotland still has one of the most concentrated land ownership patterns anywhere in the world. Um, and there's been a, a kind of pretty serious commitment to land reform in successive Scottish governments right since devolution. And that has generally been understood to be land reform which is seeking to diversify land ownership. We have concerns that part one of this bill doesn't really have viable mechanisms as it stands for diversifying land ownership. So some of the points that Linda's just made, um, we absolutely agree with and hopefully we'll get into that in the evidence session, but our view is there, there are aspects of this bill which can be amended to make it meaningful and to make it start addressing that point around diversification of ownership. 
Um, but as it stands, there's pretty serious work that needs to be done. And, and one key point that it would be great to get into, and it's certainly in written evidence, is um, too much of a focus possibly on kind of community sustainability as a basis for land reform rather than thinking about public interest concerns and thinking about diversification of ownership more broadly. Um, in the interest of time, you know, there's, there's specific proposals I can get into, convener, but I don't know if you want to save that for later down the line. Uh, let's see if it comes out uh, later down the line. So uh, this was meant to be an easy starter and a short starter just to warm you up before uh, I hand you over to the committee to ask questions. So, John. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And apologies, I can't be with you in person today. Um, I'm policy advisor for Scottish Community Alliance, which is a coalition of 28 community-led networks and umbrella organisations covering whole of urban and rural Scotland, many sectors from energy and food to housing and tourism, and a collective membership of several thousand groups who are interested in increased opportunities for ownership and access to land, but also in the distribution issues of you know, who benefits from land. And you know, very broadly, we were very disappointed with part one of the bill. The 2022 consultation was pretty encouraging, had a broad scope and a number of interesting proposals. So we're very dismayed to see that most of that had been lost when the bill was introduced. It's a very limited package of, we think, essentially performative measures that won't significantly contribute to land reform. Thank you, John. Uh, the next questions come from Monica. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, convener, and good morning to our, our panel today. Um, Given that we know that land and land use are Scotland's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, do the owners of large land holdings have a responsibility to promote net zero and climate change measures? And should there be obligations on the biggest emitters to reduce their emissions? I want to just ask all the panel. Um, so maybe I'll come to you first, Joan. Um. Yes, I mean, broadly, yes, but clearly some of them are going to need some support to do that. It's not a simple sort of switching it on and switching it off. Um, but yes, clearly, I think the existing landowners of all types, public, private, community, um, are the people who are in the position to be able to um, reduce their existing emissions and perhaps um, add sequestration and, and that should be a, a focus of public policy, how we encourage that and support it. Thank you. Linda? Yes, I would agree with John. John's points on that. Yes. And Josh? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I would I'd agree with John and just add that, first of all, just as a, a kind of key point to, to get down, that we would disagree with the framing of, of large land holdings within this bill and prefer to see the term significant land holding used because this indicates that you know, it's, size is an important kind of uh, mechanism for understanding concentration and scale in land ownership. But if we really want to dig into concentration, we need to think about the significance of land holding. And this is something that the Land Commission has mentioned for a few years and is something that we would like to, to get down on the record. Um, in terms of your specific uh, point, yes, we agree. I agree with John's points that there needs to be support you know, to enable this to happen. But absolutely, kind of net zero climate change biodiversity targets and improvements are kind of absolutely essential parts of land management. And so having those as criteria to um, underpin the guidance that would impact things like a transfer test or public interest test and land management plans makes absolute sense. And this can just be part of the reframing of those mechanisms as being um, tailored to meet public interest considerations. And absolutely, net zero climate change biodiversity would be key public interest considerations as we see them. Thank you for that. Just the, the point you were making there about um, language that could be in the bill, and I take your point about um, that phrase, large land holdings. When you talk about significant land holdings, do you want to maybe expand on, on what you mean by that? Because clearly in a committee, we think about the, the meaning of words and the definition around them. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so this is really building on research that the Scottish Land Commission has done, which is pointing out that so large scale land holdings can you know not be operating in the public interest they can have um they can create issues of localized power but you also get issues of localized power with much smaller land holdings say strategic bits of land between two villages um particular sites within urban areas that are possibly causing blight or a vacant and derelict land 
so it's, it's really about thinking, getting back to that core point about kind of what's a land reform bill for and diversification of ownership and meaningfully changing land management practices. And if we use this kind of blunt instrument of large scale, we're missing very significant problems of, of land ownership and land management. So, so reducing that down, you know, 500 hectares, 25% of the inhabited islands. And then, as Linda was saying, this point around urban, so having, having a more kind of uh, dynamic and proactive criteria like sites of community significance, which starts to pick up that point around significant land holdings. So it's really just, just I suppose, pushing the bill to think a bit more expansively about issues around land ownership and land management. And that is really a key way of doing it. Large scale is too blunt an instrument in our view. Okay, thank you for that. Just to expand on my um, initial question that I put to, to all the panel, um, you may remember that back in April, the Scottish Government um, announced um, a consultation on a new carbon tax on large estates um, in order to incentivise peatland restoration, tree planting and renewable energy generation. Um, do you have a view on that proposal and do you agree or disagree that taxation is um, the best way to achieve decarbonising land use and agriculture? I don't know if anyone has a strong view or wants to go first. Um, Josh, and then John, yeah, I, I think. If you all look away, uh, <laughs> who wants to go first, then it falls to me to nominate somebody, and, and invariably uh, it, uh, it, it's the wrong person, but... Josh, you've saved the day, so please don't all look away. Um, <laughs> raise your hand, uh, Josh. Um, yeah, so we have, a, we have a specific briefing on this that I can send to committee afterwards, so just but in a nutshell. Um, we're supportive of exploring other kind of regulatory measures for reforming land management, um, and taxation is certainly one of them, and, and other mechanisms for kind of more effectively regulating land to achieve net zero I think could be really effective. We're obviously thinking about our membership as well, who would be imp uh, impacted by a potential taxation like this. Um, but broadly speaking, we're supportive. We need to look at those support mechanisms that John was talking about as well and how to make sure that landowners of all types are enabled to, to make use of the grant mechanisms to do particularly peatland restoration for a, for a taxation like this. Um, but yeah, we think it's a, a potentially good idea and we are certainly encouraging, if we're thinking about kind of net zero climate change and natural capital more broadly, um, that we have decent regulation and taxation which sits alongside grant mechanisms and talk of like private finance and investment. We need to have kind of a carrot and stick approach. So yeah, we're broadly supportive. Thank you. And John? Yeah, similar to Josh, uh, we were kind of certainly supportive of the idea that tax is one of the levers that government has to use to, to you know, direct land use of land ownership and so on. Um, the particular proposal that was put forward on the carbon tax, we thought, you know, needed quite a bit more work and there were probably far too many exclusions and caveats in it to really contribute significantly. But it's certainly an area that we're supportive of further work being done. OK, thank you. Linda, you were, you were fine. That's yeah. OK. Um, OK, um, on to land management plans. Um, they are required to say how the land is being managed in a way that contributes to achieving net zero, adapt, adapting to climate change and increasing or sustaining biodiversity. Um, I want to ask the panel, is this adequate or are there other criteria that might also be appropriate to include? And do you think these should be addressed through primary or secondary legislation? And I think Josh, again, is maintaining eye contact, so we'll go to Josh. John, John was looking away, just... just not... <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes, we do think there should be other um, considerations that kind of bring in the social, economic and cultural as well. So in our written evidence, we've set out some of the things, some of the kind of policy objectives that could be used to frame regulations. Um, and just to say that we think that these should be in, in secondary legislation and guidance. So there could be a statement of saying, you know, land management plans will be, will be subject to public interest considerations set out in guidance, something, something along those lines. Um, but, you know, that could be, that could be things such as um, achieving more diverse ownership of land, furthering sustainable development, advancing community wealth building, 
increasing community agency, which could be picked up through the community engagement obligations, um, meeting repopulation or resettlement criteria, um, adequate supply of social housing. So there's a whole host um, of additional kind of um, considerations that could be in there. And interestingly, some of which are kind of within the policy memorandum already, but are just not being necessarily framed or converted into these kind of public interest considerations that could end up in guidance. Thank you. Join. Yes, I mean, I, sorry, I was looking away trying to find my notes of the <laughs> list of things that could be included, which is very similar to that that Josh has just provided. Um, this is one of the aspects with land management plans that we're you know, very sort of disappointed with. And the, the kind of headline notion of large landowners being required to prepare and consult on a land management plan um, is something, as a principle, we're very supportive of. But the bill, um, the implementation in the bill, the details are very, very vague. And the caveats are such that it will only apply to very, very few landowners. And then the processes for reporting a breach have very, very limited eligibility. So there's probably no chance that anybody would ever get sanctioned for not having a land management plan and so on. So there's a great deal more meat that needs to be in there behind land management plan, the land management plan idea in order to make it worthwhile in our view. And you know, Josh has very ably provided a list of some of the criteria that we think ought to be considerations when drawing up a, a plan. Okay, that's helpful to get that on the, the record. Um, just wanted to focus on the biodiversity aspect for a, for a moment. Um, I just wonder if the panel has a view on whether sustaining biodiversity is a sufficient requirement or should the bill require the land management plans to say how the land is being used to increase biodiversity? Um, Linda's definitely looking away, so I'm looking, I'm looking again at you, Josh. Um, yes, I think, yeah, we would be supportive of that, just the idea okay. of sustaining biodiversity. If we think of, of some of the reasons or the, the rationale, as we understand it, behind something like land management plans is to, is to reform poor, ma poor land management practices, um, which I don't necessarily need to name them, but we're probably aware of, of, aware of what they are. And as John says, we have concerns around the bill's mechanisms being strong enough and clear enough to address that. But if it's about addressing poor land management, we may be dealing with you know, significant land holdings that have very depleted biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So the idea of sustaining a level of poor biodiversity seems, seems like a missed opportunity when we could be saying actually that it needs, needs to be increased and improved. Mm -hmm. Well, just to test you a little bit further on that then, you know, do you have a, a view on how specific the land management plan should be? So. I know we don't want to maybe give a, a long list of, of particular problems, but whether it's management around deer or um, rhododendron, which I think was yeah. part of a debate in, in the Parliament last week. So is that the kind of detail that you think would be required for the plans to be effective? So I think, so again, not on the face of the bill, just a kind of a, a clear statement about public interest considerations and guidance, but then you could have quite extensive guidance, which work as a kind of framework. I think it, it could be, there could be a danger in creating a, a land management plan, you know, pro forma that is far too prescriptive. We, we, do, we have a, a lot of different types of landowners around Scotland and, and we don't have a one size that fits all, but there needs to be a set of considerations which a landowner will have to show that they are engaging with and then the Land and Communities Commissioner being empowered to properly um, interrogate that and feel that if they are missing things or if a community or someone else is able to report a breach mm -hmm. because they feel like a rhododendron issue isn't being dealt with and then there are mechanisms within the bill to pick that up. So not super prescriptive within the guidance but kind of headline principles but then robust mechanisms to check in with whether or not those land management plans are actually delivering what they're supposed to be. Okay, thank you. And just sticking with land management plans, is there a risk that the production of the plans becomes quite a formulaic exercise and there's a big role for external consultants and you start to lose the meaningful engagement with, with communities. Does anyone have a, a view on that or, or any advice to the committee as we, as we look at this part of the bill? Um, Joan does. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to speak on that. I mean, I, th I think the first thing is you would, perhaps I'm being very naive here, but I, I would rather assume that 
most, if not all, large-scale landowners already have some sort of plan. They don't get up in the morning and, and do stuff on a whim. They have, you know, fairly worked out plans that are probably more detailed than the, the legislation is expecting. Um, and what they're being asked to do is to consult on plans and, and do them in a particular format. So I think I think they already do a great deal of planning, I would assume. If they don't, one would suggest they're not actually very responsible landowners with thousands of hectares. Um, the second thing, it does rather depend on the process, but it is it is possible to define processes that, that don't necessarily need to work in that way. I come from a woodlands forestry background, and we're very familiar with the long-term forest plan process. So all existing woodlands, we're not talking about woodland creation, but all existing woods and forests over 100 hectares, which is a pretty small threshold, need a long-term forest plan to be in receipt of forest management grants. So it's tied to subsidy and grant. And this has a kind of multi-stage process as kind of an initial scoping um, to outline um, outline the main objectives, um, stakeholders invited to comment. Then there's a draft plan written, um, which goes on the uh, public register for 28 days for public comment. Um, and throughout the process, Scottish Forestry manage this, ask the questions, check it complies with the UK forestry standard, et cetera. And, and we'll bring up things like, you've got rhododendron <laughs> in your forest, what are you doing about it, rather than having it in the legislation. Um, and actually, in practice, a lot of this is done electronically these days with, you know, and can be done by, you know, an in-house forester. Sometimes they're done by consultants. But it's a process that's well understood, works not perfectly, but reasonably well, and probably goes into much more detail than we're expecting of these land management plans. So I think it's perfectly possible to divine a, a, develop a process that works effectively for land managers and stakeholders. There will be some extra costs and, and maybe some support needed for others, but I don't think we should exaggerate it as being a, a complete festival for external consultants, unless, unless a process is designed that makes it that way. Just finally and, and, and briefly, John, you mentioned support for others. I don't know if you meant, you know, communities um, when you said that, but you know, what is your view about the, the capacity? And I know communities are, are all very different, but um, if there is an established process, are you confident that communities have enough time and, and resource and knowledge, or is there extra support that would be required to make sure it is meaningful? They, they, it will depend, because some will have, some of the community landowners, of course, have in-house staff and foresters. Others, they may need support. I help produce long-term forest plans for a couple of community woodland um, organisations. And there is a small amount of grant available from Scottish Forestry through the SRDP to, and to enable that to happen and for communities and for others to, to go through the process. OK, thank you, John. I see uh, Josh is signalling. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it was just, well, first of all, to... to back up what John is saying. We, I, I agree, we agree with what, with what John is saying and that a significant number of landowners of all stripes are already producing these kind of things. It will just be a case of potentially tailoring it to the specific guidance that's set out. Um, and, and to build on what John was saying, you know, most, well, all community landowners provide community engagement. There's local community democracy. They produce land management plans. There's a varying degree of um, capacity, as John was saying. But these things are already being done, and there are things that can be learned from the community land sector, particularly in terms of the community engagement. Um, and, and just to flag and, and, and get on the record that, so if, if the thresholds for producing a land management plan, just using the scale criteria, um, are brought down to 500 hectares, as I think the, th the, the three of our organisations are suggesting. We're talking about there being around 2,025 land holdings that would have to produce land management plans, most of which will already produ be producing some form of land management plan. Um, and that's opposed to around 420, as it stands on the, uh, the 3,000 hectare mark. So we're talking about a big increase, but also not a huge number of land management plans being produced. Thank you. That's helpful. Before you leave that, can you just verify where you got that figure from on, on land holdings? Uh... Yeah, it's in the financial memorandum for the bill. So you're confident that that takes in every single farmer uh, that comes with, within Scotland, that is, if it's over, 
uh, I think it, my maths is probably going to let me down, but 2.471 times 500 uh, hectares gives us about 1,600 acres, roughly. You're confident it takes in every single farmer who farms 1,600 acres or more. Yes, yeah, so, well, that's what's in the financial memorandum. And according to a parliamentary question that was lodged by Ariane Burgess, with I think information that was drawn from the 2021 agricultural census, 96.4% um, of agricultural holdings in Scotland are less than 500 hectares. I think that's individual businesses, isn't it? But individual businesses may be more than one holding. So that brings up the question around aggregate land holdings, which I guess we could which talk we're going to come to in due okay. course. And I'm going to hand over, I think. Yes. Okay, um, the point that Josh had made a moment ago about, about um, thresholds, is that something that you would be perhaps looking for an amendment yes. at a later stage yet? Absolutely. You might just want to be clear. Thank you. And here comes Bob with his question. Sorry, Mark, do you want to come in first? Yeah, just on, on land management plans. Um, I, mean, I suppose I'm, I'm interested to get your views on what good consultation actually looks like, because as John's already said, you know, we already have forest strategies, we have, you know, forest licensing process um, that involves communities and in, in inputting into that. There's also local place plans. So in terms of like, like actually coming up with a meaningful consultation where communities feel like they're actually participating in decisions rather than just being asked, you know, what do you think of this? I'm wondering if there's, if there's good practice there and is there a danger perhaps with the bill that, you know, it does set up a bit of a tick box exercise at, at one level. So how do, you, how, how do we make it a kind of meaningful, appropriate, but participative process for communities that they actually feel, you know, their objectives are being met? I'll, I'll take this first. I mean, the Scottish Land Commission has um, a kind of first set of guidance for landowners on consultation, uh, community consultation. And not, notwithstanding the fact that some of these land holdings are not necessarily, there's not going to be necessarily obvious communities round about them, there are clear, where, where there are uh, communities that have an interest or are close to or live on these land, on the land, there, there are groups and mechanisms in which landowners can consult, um, communities themselves consult, so community councils, established community groups, um, local authorities also have a view of, of who active community groups are. So there are very kind of clear routes on which landowners can uh, consult with communities and it need not be a tick box exercise. I think there's a potential danger where it's a, a where the community actually live on the land. And I think that's something that we have to be kind of mindful of. And I think that's something that's been picked up in other people's uh, responses to the committee, that, that that can make it quite challenging for the people that necessarily live on that land to consult. But more broadly, there are the established groups um, and individuals that have a clear interest in what happens with the land. Yeah. You mean they're less likely to be open about what their true yes. feelings are about yeah. land management? Yeah. Josh, did you want to come in on that? Um, I mean, I, I agree with, with what Linda said. Um, and I think, so if we look at the, the kind of engagement that community landowners do, which may be slightly different because they're kind of locally democratically accountable and there's kind of a feedback mechanism through, through their membership and, and people joining the board and AGMs and things like that. But something that can be kind of replicated more broadly is, is just things like village hall, community centre meetings in which there's a genuine dialogue you know, we're starting to see emerging practice of, of like local management boards being set up voluntarily. So you have community members who kind of sit on a local management board for a particular land holding, especially if it's doing a more um, contentious land use change. Um, so, so, so processes like that, you know, there is a danger this becomes a tick box exercise of, you know, a report being produced by a land agent and then it just being brought to, to a village hall or a community space for it to be kind of signed off. So we'd want to see kind of more meaningful dialogue and communities having agency in terms of being able to shape decisions, not, not having a veto over anything, but being able to actually like meaningfully shape decisions. So how do you think, I think good practice should be codified? Should that be on the face of legislation or guidance or there's just an expectation that will evolve? So I think it needs. I think it needs to be in in guidance. But there is. 
at the moment there is a lack of clarity over kind of if we're talking about community engagement obligations of what those community enga engagement obligations should look like and kind of what the definition of the community <coughs> is um, at some points in the bill um, particularly around kind of say reporting breaches of, of land management plans and community obligations the definition of community is tied very specifically to a community body that's eligible to use community right to buy that's far too restrictive that's a community organization that has to be set up in a very very particular way and also has to have already had engagement with the government to get a section 34 out this is incredibly prescriptive so we need to we need to maybe have a have a clearer definition of how community is being used and some sense of what those community obligations are but the meat of that should be in, in guidance, as with other things, just to keep the face of the bill as kind mm -hmm. of uh, straightforward as possible. Yeah. John, did you want to come in? Yes, so I particularly echo that point, that we're very clear that the, the opportunity to engage has to be much wider than land reform compliant bodies and should be open. Um, currently, the, as the bill's written, there's no real obligation on landowners to take any notice of comments or not as far as I can see, even to document them. Um, the, it's impossible to set up a situation where everything has to be taken on board and, and um, delivered. But I think the first thing, you need very clear sort of documentation, production of a sort of issues log of these were the, the points that were made. So there's a degree of transparency about um, what comments did come from the community or for others, because um, I imagine public agencies yeah, Nature Scotland so would also comment on aspects of plans. Um, and also there's probably a, a, an important role for whoever is the manager of the process um, in, in sort of helping or ensuring that landowners do try and accommodate um, reasonable or really productive comments from consultees and you know to go back to the long-term forest plan process that's Scottish forestry's role not just to um, approve the plan but actually to ensure that landowners do take on board where possible reasonable comments and suggestions um, and so I think that's something that's very much in guidance but it's a, it's also a cultural thing for whichever body is you know, overseeing the process, whether that's mm. the Land Commission or the Agriculture Department or whoever it might. Yeah. Well, Linda, I think you were saying at the beginning of the session that, you know, the bill isn't quite so focused on urban areas. But, I mean, that does now bring in the issue of local place plans. And I guess I can see in my head, you know, a local land management plan for surrounding estates, surrounding a village, but then also a local place plan for a village yes. that may or may not incorporate aspects of land which is owned by the local state, which may be relevant for housing. Uh, you know, we, some of those issues were highlighted in the committee's trip to Ireland Persia. So I'm just, it feels like this could start to get a bit messy and there needs to be some clarity as to, you know, where, where the democratic influence lies. So I, I don't know if you've got thoughts on how you bring these things together. <clears throat> I, I mean, I th yes, I think your, your point about the local place plans and you, having the I'm aware the committee did go to Perthshire, so you'll have very clearly seen the influence of uh, a kind of multiple uh, aggregated land, really, in terms of the impact that that has on communities. I, I think you're right. I think there is. Um, an opportunity to, to link in local place plans and the consultation, and that might be through um, kind of assets of community significance and those types of, of points where you're actually engaging communities on the basis of what's important to them. So yes, you're, you're consulting on land management plans, but actually if you are genuinely consulting, then you are also seeking what's information on what's important to that community, be that house plots or uh, community facilities, mm. etc. So you're, you're creating, they should, it should be creating <coughs> an opportunity for collaboration and actually partnership working. So getting these mechanisms right would be extremely useful for mm. communities. Mm. And there's maybe the mechanisms are not maybe in the bill at this stage, but there's something that linking all of that could make it a, a much more powerful, yeah. a much more powerful impact. I'm aware, for example, there's a discussion in Aberfeldy, I think, around Woodland yes. Crofts at the moment. Which now is that the forestry plan or 
for FLS, or is that local place plan, or is it the land management plan, or is it, or is it, is it all three? In which case, how do you make sense of that? I suppose is what I've got in my head. Um, so thanks, Linda. Josh, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a valid concern in terms of. We don't, and this comes back to kind of a, a main point I had at the start around, you know, the, the, the onus for land reform falling on communities. We don't want to create a number of different kind of statutory mechanisms that communities have to kind of proactively engage with because it's burning out the capacity that they have. And I think you have, you raise a really important point around local place plans and there's potentially two ways in which local place plans could be, could be linked to the bill quite effectively. So one of them is, say with community engagement obligations, a landowner's land management plan having to having to pay attention to or, or whatever the phrasing might be to local land ma local place plans which are already in place so that could be within guidance and you could also have in terms of the criteria at which land management plans and transfer test or lotting decisions are made you know sites of community significance is an is an aspect of local place plans so you already have a means of if a local place plan exists and the community has proactively identified sites of significance in that area then you could have the land commission Taking a, taking a decision based on guidance about whether or not land reform mechanisms within this bill should apply to those particular sites of significance. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Did you want to come in on that? Um, no, I've got nothing really to add to what Linda and Josh have said, which okay. I would agree with entirely. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mark. Now, it is going to get messy, uh, Bob, because your question is going to come to you. I would ask you just to, to stick on the threshold questions that you had, because the Deputy Convener wants to come in, and I'm keen to come in, but you're getting first crack at them. Uh, 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 of course, Convener, I've got a line of questioning I'm going to explore, which I'm sure you, you'll let, let me do following that, that yes, supplementary yeah. session there. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to return to the scale of um, land management plans in the threshold. Uh, around that, and uh, uh, Mr. Ruskell's exchange was really helpful. It's not always about scale, but about public interest considerations and other overlapping policy considerations. That was a really helpful exchange, I, I thought. So it's currently set at uh, 3,000 hectares, um, but that's just a number for, for some people. So I have uh, Glasgow's botanical gardens and lands in my constituency. They would fit 150 times into 3,000 hectares, and I think that brings home that perhaps that threshold is just way too high and has to be re reconsidered. Um, now, the suggestion has been made that it could be set at 1,000 hectares or 500 hectares. We've had that in, in evidence. But, but I also have to think about, could there be additional burdens to what could be small businesses if we were to put those obligations on, on, on those businesses? But I get there are also responsibilities that comes with the uh, owning such significant holdings as 500 hectares or 1,000 hectares. So how do we get the balance right between the burdens on potentially small businesses and the responsibilities that I would like to see happen? Uh, maybe John Hollingdale, do you want to come in first in relation to that? Yes, I have two points I'd make. Firstly, of course, you, you can never, as you say, they're just numbers and you can never find the right number. Um, I don't think we could find a number small enough to capture everything that we want to be captured, which is why, you know, I think we're, we on this side all agree the idea of sites of community significance, which, which don't have that threshold because, you know, it's never going to be small enough to capture the botanical gardens, for instance. Um, so we think a different way or additional ways of flagging up important areas. Um, the second is that, as I mentioned with the long-term forest plans, there is some financial support to help with uh, businesses in the production or, you know, in the, in the delivery of that obligation. So if you are concerned about um, additional costs on certain businesses, then that's one of those things that has usually been a, it's, it's a pretty good um, basis for public support to help those businesses through it. But as I stressed earlier, I don't think it's likely to be a huge extra cost over and above what you would assume they would normally do with land management planning and, and business planning. I think that's helpful, uh, uh, John Hollingdale. I, I might just add, before I come into uh, Josh Doble, I might just layer my second question on top of that, because the is what conscious of time constraints. Uh, I think uh, Josh Doble 
said uh, that there would be 2,025 uh, landowners that would come in the gambit if it was 500 hectares as opposed to 420. That would be an additional 1,545. But Dr Doble, you also said that many of them you anticipated would also be have land management plans of a sort anyway. Indeed, you'd expect them to if they were being responsible uh, landowners. So, could you answer the same question as, as John Hollingdale? But also, can I ask you whether, if, if, if you thought, uh, Dr Doble, that if uh, a landowner of 1,000 hectares, for instance, didn't have a land management plan, would that be a risk factor? Would that concern you in the first place? So, in answer to the, f the first question, I think, I think John's, I think John's covered that. You know, the, there may be support mechanisms that would need to be there, but as I think we outlined before, you know, it's likely that some form of land management plan will already be being produced, and we consider 500 hectares to be a significant amount of land to which a land management plan should apply. Um, in terms of a thousand hectare holding that doesn't produce some form of land management plan. I don't think I could say I would be concerned off the bat. It would depend on the specific circumstances, but there would certainly be a question as to why there isn't some form of land management plan and what is the nature of that land holding if there isn't some kind of plan in place. And I think it's, it's good to be clear as well that we're not suggesting that you know, the business plan for that 1,000 hectares is published in full. There's no expectation that a business owner, a landowner, a landowner who is also likely a business owner, has to publish, do complete transparency on their, on their business planning. But this is about them looking at a business plan or a forestry plan, whatever plans they have already, and looking at the considerations, the public interest considerations that would be in guidance connected to the bill, and thinking about how they map across together, and if there's anything else they could do differently, particularly in relation to community engagement obligations. And, ju and just quickly, I know we're talking about land management plans, but there's a, there's a really strong argument for aligning the thresholds for the two mechanisms that are in the bill, the idea of a lotting process or transfer test and land management plans. That's for policy coherence and, and proportionality and, and predictability, but it's also because as it stands, there's a, there's a degree of disparity. Say if you're a landowner between 1,000 hectares and 3,000 hectares, you don't have to produce a land management plan, yet you may be subject to a transfer test. Whereas if you're over 3,000 hectares, you are producing a land management plan. You have community engagement obligations. You're engaging with these public interest considerations. And you are therefore far better placed to engage with a transfer test. If you align those thresholds, you get a much greater sense of coherence. And you don't have any of this disparity between landholders. I'm pretty sure, uh, John Stobel, that's something we'll certainly be returning to later on in the evidence session. Uh, Linda Gillespie, Excellent. any reflections on the two questions I've asked I, so far? I have nothing further to add to Josh and John. Thank you. Okay. And of course, we're talking about 3,000 hectares, um, but I'm conscious that uh, we're limiting the proposals to a single composite and contiguous holdings, and we're not looking at aggregated corporate holdings. So, um, Linda, I'll give you the opportunity to, to comment on the idea of uh, making sure that we incorporate aggregated holdings rather than the, the, the single holding. Um, would you have any views in relation to that? Um, yes, I mean, I think it would be quite important to take that into consideration. I mean, the, the, the committee have been to Perthshire, so you have seen the impact on kind of aggregated uh, land holdings can have in communities. Um, I do think there would be bodies that would you would probably wish to exempt from that in terms of the public sector. Or, and I, I note the Church of Scotland, by the nature of its aggregate holdings, are kind of small glebes. Um, I, do, I, just, I, I am in agreement with it being aggregated. And that would be okay, with, with caveats. With that yes. I saw uh, yeah. Josh Doble nodding as you were making that comment. Do you want to add anything, Dr Doble? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we think the removal of, of contiguous uh, 44D and 67H within the bill is absolutely vital. Um, and the example that we've used that, that you may have seen is, is, for example, Gresham House Limited Partnerships, who are, who are the funds that they manage are the third biggest private landowner in Scotland. We have to be careful on the phrasing of that. I know they were at committee earlier in the year and spoke on that topic. Um, so, for example, they wouldn't be picked up by this because of the nature of their holdings. They own no, none of their land holdings are over 3,000 hectares, yet they own over 53,000 hectares in total. So there has to be some means of, of picking them up. And, and just on the topic of, of Gresham House, I know when they gave evidence earlier in the year, they said that they would be providing information on the number of jobs, I think, in response to a question from you, Monica. I don't know if they've produced that yet. But we would certainly be interested, because we're not clear on the contribution that they make in terms of that. Um, 
And in terms of how the aggregate holdings could work, you know, as, as Linda says, there are some points that would need clarification. For, exa for example, public utility organisations. Um, there are actually existing mechanisms in the bill. I can send the detail of this so we don't get bogged down in it now, but there's a loophole. Um, at 44B, brackets 2, 15, subsection 1, which needs looking at by the committee because it opens a potential loophole for parts of a land holding that wouldn't have a land management plan applied. Um, and I think this would be a job, as John was pointing out earlier, for the Land and Communities Commissioner to look at, to think about these aggregated holdings. Are they all in one particular area, and therefore a land management plan could cover all of the aggregated holdings, or is there a decision where a land management plan needs to apply to each one? So there'd be a sense of proportionality to this. But we really, we really would miss an opportunity, keep coming back to that foundational point of diversifying ownership, if we don't pick up these kind of corporate landowners who have many holdings at a smaller size. And, and I'm sure we will return to that. Uh, John Stoll, you mentioned proportionality, and perhaps we'll return to making sure the framework for alleged breaches and enforcement compliance is, is proportionate. There's a, there is a limited framework there. I, I think the, the fine for non-compliance is a maximum of £5,000. Uh, within within the legislation, and it gives reference to, but it's not explicit about potential cross compliance uh, issues. Uh, so I'm just wondering if, if witnesses are content uh, that five thousand pounds is enough. I'd imagine it would take a lot more than five thousand pounds to produce a land management plan in, in, in the first place. And have we got that framework right? Perhaps John Hollingdale, could could you make a comment in relation to that? Um, yes. Yeah, so firstly, I think with not particularly convinced that £5,000 is a sufficient stick um, for large, to, you know, to convince all large land um, owners to produce plans. And we would much, we'd much prefer to see the potential for cross compliance penalties, um, you know, in the bill, if possible, because that, for most large landowners, is a much more significant. Um, amount of money and is repeated, could be repeated year on year rather than being a one-off fine. Um, the related issue, of course, is that it's probably vanishingly small chance for most landowners that a breach will be reported in the first place, because as it stands, breaches can only be reported by Land Reform Act compliant community bodies and a number of public agencies for whom, whom and I, to put it politely, I suspect this won't be a priority. So I think in most cases, we won't even get to that um, breach being reported and any sanction applied. So we would much, we would like to see a much wider process for reporting breaches and bringing in cross compliance um, as a mechanism to ensure that landowners meet their obligations. That's very helpful, John Hollandale. This will please the convener because you've linked into the next question, which is good for keep keeping his timmy. Go can, back to the original can, questions, Bob, on, on uh, criterion threshold. So, so I'll let so you ask this question, then I'm going to bring in the deputy. So uh, apologies, I was running through the line of questions that we, that we had agreed. Um, so um, clearly the, the, the list of those who can report breaches is relatively narrow. John Hollandale has said that. So if we looked in the round at whether the current system uh, of compli the compliance framework is adequate or otherwise. Perhaps uh, either Linda Gillespie or, or, or Dostal will comment on that, but also in reference to whether they agree with John Hollandale's comment about the list of those that can report non-compliance is too restrictive and, and too narrow. Linda Gillespie? We would absolutely agree with that. Um, being a, a kind of act compliance community body, um, I mean, communities don't set up those bodies uh, to kind of report breaches uh, or have them kind of set up to set, you know, just in case they have to report a breach or express an interest in land. Um, so we would certainly want to see a much broader definition of who could report that, including any kind of community organisations or actually even individuals. Um, there are, uh, I think all three of us have, have discussed the, the, the role that Oscar plays in terms of uh, looking at breaches for community, for charities, etc. So there are mechanisms in which these things can be dealt with. Okay, that's that wasn't particularly clear. Our point no. is we would want a no. kind of much more open uh, basis in which breaches can be proposed. And £5,000, would that be about right or too limited in relation to...? I mean, I would agree with Josh's point. It, it would, 
it is not clear that that would be a significant deterrent. I am not sure if it was yeah. Josh or John said that. Okay, so my understanding also is the Land and Communities Commissioner became aware of potential uh, uh, breaches or had a suspicion of potential breaches. However, they, they, they were aware of that. They would not have the power within this bill to uh, kickstart their own investigation. Would that be a weakness in, in relation to the system, Josh Double? Uh, yes, yeah, we think there will be a weakness. There, there needs to be an ability for the, commi the, the new commissioner to investigate breaches on their own terms. And this can be supported on your point around compliance. We think there could be some kind of light touch monitoring to, in to ensure kind of implementation. Um, but this is, you know, light touch and conversations with landowners about why aspects of their land management plans may not have been met. So kind of an understanding that there is a, there is a due pro process and a sense of proportionality. And that sense of proportionality is really important for the... Um, for the breaches that you mentioned, you know, £5,000 as a kind of blanket isn't proportionate. You know, that could be a significant amount of money to some landowners and completely inconsequential to others. So having some kind of um, fine system that could follow, you know, other examples in regulation that is linked to either percentage turnover of the holding company or linked to the p percentage value of the land holding or whatever it may be, you know, there are more um, dynamic mechanisms for picking this up. Mm. Um, and just, just a point that I didn't make earlier when you spoke about composite and aggregate, um, in terms of composite holdings, I think it would be really good for the committee to look at what the definition being used is for composite because it seems to be linked to the controlling interest in land register rather than some UK level register like Companies House. And there is a significant loophole in the bill. This is around transfer, but it's relevant here as well, that if we don't pick up the fact that sale of shares or sales of companies in terms of composite land holdings isn't picked up, then we could see the sale of shares or the sales of companies to get around any mechanism that tries to pick up a transfer of land. So we'd really welcome the committee speaking to the Scottish Government about how they're defining composite within the bill. I think my colleagues would return to that imminently. And finally, finally, uh, Linda uh, Gillespie, um, the bill is apparently silent in whether or not those reporting uh, breaches will be granted anonymity within, within the process. Is there a risk that uh, in, uh, groups or organisations who have to work on a daily or routine basis with large uh, landowners may, may be deterred from reporting breaches or, or raising concerns if anonymity is not secured. Any, any thoughts on that, Linda Gillespie? I think that would almost certainly be the case. I think uh, particularly if you, well, if you have a relationship with the landowner or indeed live in the land, then I think you are less likely to report any, any breaches at all. So, yes, uh, I would absolutely and, agree with that. And just to record, uh, Dr Doble was, was nodding your head. Uh, the, the, the official report won't capture a nodding of the head. Sorry. Yes, absolutely agree. We've already seen that issue within some of the functions of the Tenant Farming Commissioner in terms of reporting breaches under that mechanism. So, yeah. well, thank you, Convener. Yeah, I'm, I'm just pondering whether that opens the gate for anyone to make a vexatious claim without having to put their name to it. Uh, there's always checks and balances. But the Deputy Convener wanted to come in with questions. Good morning. Um, thank you for your evidence so far. Um, I just want to uh, go back to the point around the 3,000 hectares that's set out in the bill and the threshold that's been established. Beyond what's stated in the uh, policy memorandum, uh, why do you think the 3,000 figure has been selected and not the 500 hectare figure that you would suggest? That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. I think, to be honest, it's, uh, it's possibly the Scottish Government trying to, as I think John set out in his kind of main statement on the bill, there's a, a sense of possibly a lack of ambition and there's maybe a balancing act that they're trying to strike between sticking to manifesto commitments and a claim to kind of be meeting land reform commitments, but also a sense of not wanting to uh, concern investors or significant landowners. And so maybe this is a kind of a middle ground that's been landed at because it's within the kind of um, the broad cri criteria that the Land Commission had set out, although I think the Land Commission arrived at 1,000 as a more appropriate um, mechanism. Sorry, uh, more appropriate criteria. There are obviously implications in terms of um, monitoring land management plans and production of land management plans if you have 500 rather than 3,000 hectares, but we don't see that to be you know, a particular barrier. And we've done calculations on the likely cost implications which we can send. But we think maybe it's, uh, 
it's a sense of a, trying to find a middle ground rather than arriving at the thing that's going to be rather than arriving at the mechanism that's going to be most effective for achieving the ultimate aim of land reform which is diversification of ownership so that's 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 our sense of why but really it would be helpful i think to get a sense from the government about why they did that okay linda john john um, yeah, so, so there's a number of things in the bill that it's difficult to understand why they are the way they are. But as Josh says, I, th I think one hypothesis is that there's a concern to, to... There's clearly a need to deliver a land reform bill, but on the other hand, a concern that any um, effective regulatory framework around land ownership might discourage natural capital investors, and, that, and therefore everything's been very soft-pedalled from you know, from what we would want, but also from the Scottish Land Commission recommendations, which, as Josh says, were, seem, seem to settle on a 1,000 hectares um, as a sort of useful middle point. I wonder, Convener, can I very quickly go back to a point you made about the potential for vexatious complaints? Yes, that's always there, and we'd accept that, but I think there's a lot to be learned from how Oscar um, deal and regulate Scotland's 25,000 charities, um, and they have a pretty robust process for doing that, um, that I think most stakeholders feel is fairly effective and also fairly effective at weeding out and managing <laughs> the vexatious complaints that they um, receive there. So I don't think it's a, it's a deal breaker. It's about having an effective process to manage it. Sorry, I'm looking at the Deputy Convener. I'm not going to answer that question uh, or that comment. I, I, I've made my point. Mm. Uh, can okay. Deputy Convener, view anything more you want to ask? Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. So, um, uh, Land Commission recommended 1,000. Um, uh, uh, do you think the Land Commission got it right? That's a very good direct question. Um, I think the Land Commission do a lot of excellent research and as a arm's length government body are maybe not able to push mechanisms as far as organizations like we can but if we return to the foundational point of this which is around you know diversifying ownership and actually achieving some form of land reform the threshold should be as low as possible for all mechanisms to try and bring in the number of land holdings and number of land transactions to have some kind of meaningful change okay so you think they got it wrong I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm not going to put words into your mouth. Um, uh, can I... <laughs> I'm taking that as a wrong then. <laughs> so, um, can I... Uh, Linda, can I... Uh, sorry, can I turn to John and, and his evidence the, uh, around the issue of consultation on land management plans and engagement? You raise concerns about the, the lack of a definition of community contained within the legislation. Um, can you expand on what you mean by a uh, lack of a definition of community? And do you have a definition that you think should be in the bill? And if so, do you think it should be in the face of the bill or of whether it should be in the regulatory, regulatory provisions of the bill? Um, so, yeah, the, a number of points there. One thing that we were very concerned about was that it might use the same definition of community that's elsewhere in the bill, which is very restrictive and with its Land Reform Act compliant bodies. Um, and we felt that certainly should not be um, the case, that it needs to be wider than that, because there are a very limited number of such bodies across Scotland. Um, the second point was that it shouldn't be confined purely to those who live directly on the land in question, so that there are those um, around the land. Um, I think we would be comfortable if the bill said those local stakeholders who have a demonstrable interest in the land, um, so that could cover individuals and groups who lived near, you know, adjacent to as well as on the land and a wide range of groups as well as, as potentially individuals. And then if that's on the bill, perhaps more detail about how that's interpreted can be in um, guidance, perhaps. Because it will, you know, th there are going to be different circumstances and it's very difficult to define a one-size-fits-all model in 
primary legislation. So we were clearer about what we didn't want it, to, how we didn't want it to be restricted, rather than absolutely, this is the model that should happen because of this impossibility of one size fits all. Sorry. Can I just, can I just qu quiz you so I understand that? Community body in the legislation is defined when it comes to the leasing of land. But are you saying you also want, when it comes to consulting the community, that that community is defined and you don't feel it is sufficiently defined? Is that what you're saying, John? No. So we're concerned that the use of the, the definition of community as community, the only eligible community bodies being land reform compliant bodies is a, a greatly unnecessary restriction in the process that, that a much wider range of community bodies and individuals should be able to, to be involved in, in a number of processes through the bill, including consultation on land management plans. So you want that section of the bill rewritten and a definition of community put in might be very difficult in in parts of scotland where the community may, the nearest community may be uh miles from the bit of land uh that's in question when it comes to uh setting out a plan that's that's possibly true and that's why one size fits all is very difficult but it, but the vast majority of Scotland is covered by active community councils. I'm not absolutely sure what the percentage is, but most of Scotland has an active community council at the very least, and they do cover um, most. I'm, I'm so only, that, that's one potential problem. I'm only smiling because I know of a huge amount of community councils across the Highlands that, that don't have enough members to be uh, actually uh, working and have gone into a band. Sorry, yeah. Michael, back to you. No, that, mm. My word of caution is that I wouldn't use community councils as the, as the, as the marker here because in urban areas, of, there's many of them don't function um, uh, because of lack yeah. of members. But, but, but sorry, I, think, I was I think, just I, saying I, I, that's yeah. one option. Yeah, I, I, I just think... Um, I'm just taking on board the point you're making about the lack of definition of community and to test whether you have a clear understanding of what you think should be applied in defining a community uh, uh, against what's presently proposed within the bill. But I, I also take from what you're saying you think it shouldn't be in the face of the bill, it actually should be something which is addressed in guidance. Um, which could possibly mm. be more principle-based rather than overly prescriptive to try and help to define what a community is. Would that be a fair reflection on what you're trying yes. to say? Yes, and just to make that point that there are a great many community bodies, well-established, you know, DTAS membership, CLS membership, the membership of the networks of Scottish Community Alliance that don't meet that specific land reform um, criteria, including many of the groups that have used the asset transfer processes and are already community landowners. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you. Michael. Um, Mark, I'm going to ask you to do the first part of your couple of questions that you've got here, and then I'm going to come in on a question before you move on to your second part. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think we've actually covered the issue of thresholds in, in some debts convener, so... I was going to, I was going to well, kind of move on from that, but I was just going to come back. Well, on. before you just move on, I'm quite keen to ask a question on thresholds. Um, right. So, well, can, you, can I just can I just wrap up what I did want to come back? In yes, on absolutely, of, of course. So, um, I mean, we've already discussed, you know, sites of community significance, and when when you mentioned that, Josh, I couldn't help thinking about Tamas Castle and, you know, a relatively small estate, but with a huge amount of community interest in the assets that are there and that there are other examples that I think that have been mentioned in evidence. Do you think there's a way that we can define that within the bill? Um, because it, it, it feels like that, that's open to quite a lot of interpretation. It feels like that, that that could be a way forward to actually say, well, there's a hugely significant, you know, asset within the community and therefore you know, aspects of the bill should apply. I'm tempted, tempted to go along that line, but I, I'm, I'm sort of interested in how you would define that, because like community, we could end up getting into a bit of a grey area. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very happy to answer. So, yeah, yeah, there is, there's always a, a kind of tension around 
definitions. And I think the, the danger of straightjacking definitions, which we'll probably come on to if we get a chance to talk about the public interest, and as John was saying around these issues of focusing on community as communities with a Section 34 letter, if you make it too restrictive, that's an issue. And the point of this kind of discretionary criteria of sites of community significance is that you have a clear phrase on the face of the bill, sites of community significance, which is then explained in guidance. And then you can potentially link up with existing mechanisms, as we spoke about earlier, with local place plans, which has a very similar mechanism. And so you'd have communities who are able to go through a process of lodging that is a site of community significance to us, and then the Land and Communities Commissioner would have the same guidance with public interest considerations to look at that and decide, is that a designation that I want to officially put a label on, and therefore these land reform mechanisms will apply. So although it seems like the public interest, although it seems like a kind of nebulous loose term, it's actually kind of like has existing legal precedent or statutory precedent. And the thing is, the, the key point is around getting that discretionary criteria on the face of the bill and then guidance which will be drawn up by the Commission. And there's already you know, research that I, I believe has been commissioned by Scottish Government that SRUC have done on this, talking about how this could work. So it's an active, and you know, the Commission mentioned it a lot in their evidence. So it's a very active point of kind of thinking about how this could work, but, but we and other bodies have done a lot of thinking on this over the last two years, and it, to us it's pretty clear, and hopefully in evidence it is, we can certainly provide further written evidence if that's helpful. Okay, so that's reflected in planning legislation then? So a, a version of it is, right. which, which the committee and the government and other stakeholders could decide if that's an appropriate way to go down, but there is an example within local place plans. Okay, John and Linda, do you want to come in on this? Or? Um, well, it's just to kind of strengthen that point. I think it, it also has the potential, the, the piece of work that Josh talks about from the R, R, uh, Scottish Rural Agricultural College, talks about proactive communities engaging proactively in this. And I think there's a, this could potentially provide a mechanism that will move communities onto the front foot. Um, and it would be very welcome across all the legislative uh, you know, community impairment act as well as land reform. I think it could be a very helpful addition. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, now, the committee does have a, another question. Um, and this is in relation to the minimum threshold for prohibiting and notifying land transfers. So, you're going to come in and say now, but like oh. to go back to the oh, okay. threshold, right, if fine. I may. I've been waiting okay. very patiently Hold as on to that thought. Uh, we'll come Hold that to thought. You're, you're going to get <laughs> Mark Ruskell's uh, question in a minute. So I want to go back to the thresholds, if I may, and community consultation, because it was one of the issues uh, that we've heard. And Josh, I accept the fact, and I think the point that you'd made and other panellists have made, that if you're a relatively large um, a state, you're probably already drawing up plans. And we've seen some very useful plans uh, from Buclu Estate in our visits and from uh, Athol Estates who, who've uh, drawn up plans and put it out to the community. And some of the other places we've visit, visited, we haven't seen any plans. Uh, we've had a lot of talk about plans that are being developed. So my question is, you're talking about if you drop it down to 500 hectares, uh, which for many f small farmers I seem to remember all the things that I have to do like uh, carbon budgets, soil testing maps, herd health plans, Scottish quality crops plans, the quality uh, meat Scotland plans for the livestock and all the other issues that I have to then draw up for my uh, single farm payment or my basic uh, support payments. It's quite a lot of plans. And now we're talking about going out and putting, you're suggesting those people go out and put it to the local community. Now I've watched uh, Forestry and Land Scotland do uh, community consultations on forest plans. Um, and it worries me what level you think small farmers and small landowners will have to do and how much it's going to cost them. So you might like to see it. What, what, what do you think the level of consultation will be required? How many meetings, who, who they publicise it to, and what the costs are going to be on that individual um, when it comes to drawing out the plan? I don't know if that's you, Josh, or John, but I'm very happy to take either. Happy to come in first. Um, and just, just a kind of headline point of, I guess, small farms and smaller farms are kind of subjective 
terms, and I suppose the point made earlier about the answer to that parliamentary question of 96.4% of farms, I take your point about ownership, which is why we probably need to talk about aggregation, because if you have a, a, farm, a small farmer or a farmer who has a number of land holdings, it seems proportionate then that they should be engaging with the community if they're holding a number of land holdings within one area, which is taking them over 500 hectares, or significantly over that if it's, if it's aggregated. Um, but the point about proportionality is a very fair one, and I think a very kind of... Um, accurate one that would have to be in guidance that that these measures need to be proportionate that if you have you know um, a land holding that is just over the threshold is a single land holding and they're already producing a number of, of plans on a number of different topics then parts of those can just be used within a land management plan for the land reform bill and the community engagement um, associated with that if they are a small farmer they are likely to be members of that community as well and that's why it's important as you mentioned to have means of, of, of making sure vexatious claims don't come in if you get kind of personality um, uh, differences or, or issues so, so a sense of proportionality would need to be in that and that could be written in like quite simply to guidance because I think that's a fair point but I think the, you know the term family farm or small farm is also very subjective and we really need to look at like the actual the actual numbers of particularly around aggregation because then that does change the level of proportionality but John, yeah, okay but I, I mean I think you referred to land agents uh, at some stage of course I was a land agent of course uh, at some stage and yeah. uh, I know that if I was going out to do in engage with the local community it would probably probably by the time that I'd engaged with them, written to them, uh, met with them, uh, it would be hours of work. Um, and I'm sure the pittance that I was paid when I was a land agent has gone up. I mean, it, you know, you're probably not far off £250 an hour for a professional land agent to draw up a plan by the time they've done it. You know, it doesn't take long before it becomes three or four thousand pounds to do a community engagement. Do you think that's reasonable for small uh, family farms to do? Because that's more than the profit than they get in some years uh, from an agricultural uh, operations. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, noting the points I said earlier about the, the use of the terms kind of family farm and small farm, I think that's why proportionality is so important and I don't think we I don't think anyone wants to see a land reform bill which is about diversifying ownership and getting positive land management to be hitting farmers who are producing food and are living in and with their communities talking about land agents and the need for kind of these really substantial um, staggered penalties for things like land management plans is to pick up poor land management on very significant on, on significant land holdings this is not about targeting small farms and I think there's 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 ways within guidance and there's ways, you know, working with the Commission to draw up guidance which is not creating excessive issues for farmers who are over the 500 hectare threshold, of which it will be a small number unless we start talking about aggregation. Uh, and you've just said the one thing that always terrifies me as a parliamentarian, that you don't do it on primary legislation, you just come up with some figures afterwards, and as a parliamentarian, or, or some directions afterwards, which as a parliamentarian, when I'm meant to be passing uh, legislation, which I understand, but I don't understand if the, the stuff isn't on the bill, um, that I leave it to somebody else to do it at a later day, who might not, Josh, be as reasonable as you. Well, there is always a danger of that, but I suppose we can look to pretty clear precedent in something like the Outdoor Access Code, which is seen, although there may be disagreement, as pretty much an excellent example of how this works. You have a statement intervention on the face of the bill around you know, access, access to land, and then very significant guidance, which has worked pretty well over the last 21 years. So I think we have, we know, we know how to do this, and what in, is already a very complicated legislation, legislation in terms of the face of the bill. We don't need what we need to see through the process of amendment is a simplification and a strengthening of this, not further, um, further, further words and complications. There's, you know, there's guidance. We have a land commission which is fantastic, and we should lean upon their expertise and their research to help shape guidance that's also kind of accountable. OK. Um, we could, of course, discuss the Scottish Outdoor Access Code at length, which is a subject might. close to my heart, having been in force for 20 years and never been reviewed or reconsidered uh, since that day. But we're not going to. We're going to go to Mark's next question. Mark. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kavina. I, I'll just come back then to this question about the fact there's no minimum threshold for prohibiting and notifying land transfer. So, obviously, 
the whole estate land holding needs to be above the threshold, but once it's within that threshold, there's no um, you know min minimum size, I guess, for for a um, you know a, a, a transfer um, you know which then falls within the prohibition notifying requirements. I'm just wondering if you if you think that if you support that. And if you think there's perhaps any unintended consequences, I suppose, you know, we took some evidence from Athol States who were talking about the very small transfers of land alongside footpaths or backs of gardens and things which they might be involved in. And they were saying from their perspective, you know, how as a larger estate, if they were then, um, you know, coming under some of these, these requirements, um, because there's no minimum threshold for the transfer of those very small assets. So that would be problematic for the community as well as for them. Yeah. <clears throat> so do you support it, basically, the fact there's no minimum threshold? <clears throat> Those situations where we've got broadcasting pushing one button to allow you to speak <laughs> and you pushing another one to allow yourself to speak, which is cancelling the broadcasting's permission to speak that they're giving you. So um, let's just... Can you hear us, John? Yes, sorry. Um, and sorry, Mark. Yes, I think we would expect that there would be, in effect, a sets of transfers that might be excluded from this. Um, but I don't think you can necessarily define that by just making it an area. It's about the context of what the proposed transfer is, I think. Um, and so, if, if I thought it might be useful to look at the um, prior notification, it would, you received a sort of hypothetical case study um, in correspondence from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a while ago, I think back in May, uh, we set up a scenario where there was a 1,500 hectare estate being sold for the first time in many generations and a village adjacent, which had included a number of holiday cottages and there was a village adjacent that um, wanted to, um, had a need for affordable housing and had a body that was working on this for, for years. Um, under the status quo, of course, the estate can be sold completely off market with no notification to the community. Um, mm -hmm. Under the bill, the landowner would have to notify the ministers who have formed the community, and of course, everything proceeds swimmingly. But the reality is that this only works because you have all these, um, everything perfectly aligned. Um, if the estate was under a thousand hectares, they wouldn't notify the community, um, and it only gets to progress because this is exceeding community, existing community body. Um, and this demonstrates, I think, the fact that you need, it's essential to include these sites of local significance, which can be very, very small, and it's also essential, demonstrates why you need this much wider eligibility um, for the initial stages, at least, to. Um, for prior notification that goes to a much wider set than just existing land reform compliant bodies. And in this case, because the bit the community is interested in is only one hectare, um, if you have a system, and, and therefore is, you know, would have to be a very, very small threshold, um, but if you set any number, almost certainly would be excluded. If you move to a system where you have sites of local significance that the community has, um, pre-notified, then it makes it easier, I think, to say that smaller sites and sales from large landowners can be um, judged to be out with the scope of the, the bill. But I'd be very loath to have a particular number threshold involved, and it would work much better if you had a mechanism for sites of local significance to make sure that the things that really mattered to communities were captured and, and therefore would give larger landowners, more certainty that they can just, you know, do excambians and transfer mm. a, a piece of land to a tenant to build a house or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good example of where clearly there would be significance of this housing need in the community is one hectare that could go from 
uh, temporary accommodation into, into permanent housing. But I suppose the issue that was raised with us was if a fence is being moved by a couple of metres or something like that, would that be captured by this bill? And is your point then that that could be deemed to be not significant to the community and therefore under that definition could be left out of those provisions? I, th I think that's right. And I would, I would imagine there's in those, you know, there ought to be examples. You can't, can't have this, you can't absolutely define every circumstance, but I would think it's quite reasonable that that sort of thing is excluded from the bill. Or, and whether it's excluded on the face of the bill or it's just that's the guidance given to the Land and Communities Commissioner or whoever is administering this, that you know, these de minimis transfers are, are not what the bill is about. And I don't think any of us think that that's what the bill is about. OK, right, thanks. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to go on to Douglas, but I notice our timings are going to be pressurised, so I'm just going to ask everyone just to make sure they give succinct answers where possible. Uh, Douglas, you've got some questions. Uh, yeah, think. thanks, Convener. I'm, I'm, we're still on the topic of uh, community right to buy process. And it was actually following on from, from, from Mark's question. You know, are there pre-notification and registration provisions are the pre-notification and registration provisions unnecessarily complex and difficult to navigate? And is this likely to act as a deterrent to uh, communities? Maybe, Linda, if you want to kick off on that one. Um, I suppose it just, it's not so much that it will act as a, a deterrent. I mean, people will be... Land holdings may not have changed hands for generations. So communities will, will not necessarily have set up bodies mm -hmm. in case land becomes mm -hmm. available or in case they, they have to object to a land management plan. So they would be artificially, and if we encourage them to do so, they would be artificially sustaining a, a structure if there wasn't already an established community organisation there on the off chance something might happen. And that just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Communities are not uh, generally, in our experience, that proactive. They tend to react to the sale of an asset or yep. you know, the, you know, the disposal. So, I just I think it's a deterrent in that it wouldn't be effective um, if that was the requirement. If it was that narrow a requirement. And I guess that ties in with my next question in terms of the tight time scales. Yes. Is the time scales enough for a community? I think it'd be okay when there's a community Absolutely group not. established. But if one needs to get get going, is the time scales enough in there? I mean, frankly, even for an established community transfer body, the time scales are tight because if it's just coming onto the market, you know, the 40 days to decide whether you're going forward, you're going to take it forward to um, uh, secure this land, is that's far too tight. Is it 30, 40 days? 40 and 30, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you're not an established group, then it's just you're not you're just not going to uh, stand any sort of chance. And we have, I mean, we have, uh, but you know, the Scottish Land Fund is open at that early stage to a whole range of community bodies to pursue. So I think there's very much a case for a kind of a more open uh, definition of a community body to pursue a kind of a transfer. Certainly at that early stage, if that might not be the structure, well, it won't. It's likely it won't be the structure for purchase at what the point of purchase, but certainly just to get into the process, a much a wider definition. So I have to ask then, if, if the 40 days plus another 30 days is, is too tight, what do you think is it, it should be? Or is it a different way of, of doing it altogether? Um, if the, I mean, it, it's that point about having a broader definition of the community that can pursue it um, certainly at that expression of interest stage, uh, you, 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 certainly at a, a three-month period, I think, would be kind of reasonable to get into that consultation of actually whether you're taking this forward and it does meet the needs of your community to then get into the community right to buy process. Okay. Uh, Josh, do you want to...? Yeah, sure. Just a couple of, of points to, to build on what... Linda was saying. Um, first of all, we really welcome the kind of transparency mechanism within the prior notification, the fact that that land transfers are going to have to be kind of on an open register. You know, 61% of land sales are off market between 2020 and 2021. We want to see that, you know, severely reduced. So that's a very welcome measure. Um, we share the same concerns that Linda has just, just outlined. Um, 
And I suppose these are concerns with the community right to buy process. So there are ways of streamlining the community right to buy process, either through this bill or adjacent to this bill, to make the prior notification mechanisms much more effective. And so, yeah, there is the issue around timescales. There could be, for example, something that could be done is, is ministers being um, obliged to provide kind of standard submissions for community bodies to assist compliance and to speed up the process. Um, a Section 34 letter could have to be produced for a community body within a working week rather than it can take up to about two months at the moment. So there's a number of kind of points, we can send further evidence on this, of, of points of kind of streamlining the existing community right to buy process which would make this function um, much more straightforwardly. Um, there is a need for clarity on the kind of register that's spoken about or the, the prior notification list. So who holds and manages that register? What are the eligibility criteria? And we would want those criteria to be as broad as possible for an initial registration of interest of being on the register and then having 30 days to decide if they want to proceed to sale. That seems proportionate, but we need clarity on, that, on, on the register that communities will sign up to. Uh, and I guess time back to Mark Gruskell. Last question. Let's say, for example, there's a cottage on a landowner's got a cottage on a on a large uh, estate that he's he's looking to, to to sell. Do you think that should? Do you think that would be dilate, uh, delayed by this whole process? And is it would it be right to delay it? And how do we get around that? So, in, so in that example, that's a, that's an interesting case in point because I guess the decision underpinning essentially the transfer test being what we're talking about here, we're saying that that needs to be underpinned by public interest considerations, some of which might be supply of adequate housing in that area. So if, a land, so if the new commissioner has to make a decision on is there enough adequate affordable housing in that area and a, and a piece of housing stock is being sold that falls within the criteria, then an assessment could be made on whether or not there needs to be a process of lotting and an intervention in the sale of that house if there is concern around housing stock in that local area. So that would be an example of how it could work, and actually there may need to be a prior notification mechanism applied, or there may need to be a lotting decision. I, I, I just think that maybe, does that, do you not think that overcomplicates it for just one cottage within, a, a, within a, an estate? I don't think it overcomplicates it, because it seems quite straightforward to us how that would be set out. I mean, a decision would have to be made, and it could well decide relatively promptly from the Commissioner that actually there doesn't need to be any mechanisms applied, and there doesn't need to be an intervention, and the sale just proceeds. Um, but it depends on the number of houses in that local area, one cottage on an estate could be very significant in an area that's facing depopulation. So it will be context specific, which is why that guidance is so important and the commissioner and the team behind them and the fact that the commissioner is embedded into the commission will be so important. Okay, um, thank you. Going on to the last question. Do you think it's helpful to add a further complex right to buy process to the existing process, particularly whilst it's under review at present? John, do you want to have a go at that one? Um, yeah, we're not convinced about that. I mean, if, you, if I can go back to your previous point, I think that one of the advantages of having the sites of local significance mechanisms is that that community that's interested in that cottage or cottages, if they've already put that marker down, then it's known to the landowner before they make any decision about selling. It's not delaying the process. It's actually part of the process that the landowner understands. I mean, I, I would agree with all the other things that Josh and Linda said on that. In terms of the, the review of the community right to buy, I think we're all really disappointed that that's been taken place separately um, and on a different time scale, particularly because this, the, the measures in part one of this land reform bill lean so heavily on the community right to buy, and yet we don't quite know what that might look like under review. So, yes, I, I would agree entirely. It's not enormously satisfactory to add something to a process that's under review. It would be, would be much better to have known the outcome of the community right to buy review or have it as part of this process, and then we could manage the whole thing in the round. Because this is one of the, cum the cumulative legislation on community bodies and land reform has not been done sort of holistically, you have lots of different definitions for community bodies. The, a, a body that can use the asset transfer process is not necessarily eligible for the community right to buy process and so on and so on. And there is a real danger here that we had something extra. Uh, I'm not sure what we can do about the fact that the community right to buy review is happening on a different timescale 
but we're, I think it's fair to say we're not, not very happy about it. But it's not ideal at all. Thank you, John. Briefly, Josh, Linda, anything to add on that? Josh? Yeah, just, just quickly on the community right to buy review. We agree with, with John's disappointment, and you know, we're going to feed into that process, and, we, and we, we really need to see legislation that's going to amend community right to buy in the whole in, in, in 2026 in the new parliament. Um, but just to, just to point out that so there isn't necessarily the introduction of new community right to buy mechanisms here. There's like a, a new pre-notification register, and then it's leading upon existing late application procedures. So really what we need to see happen, and, and what I think Linda and I have detailed, is a change to process to make it work, not necessarily a change to the legislation. So I think that can happen concurrently with the community right to buy review. It's not ideal, but there's a way of making it work. And we do think that the prior notification mechanisms with some amendment to that process could be a helpful means of achieving more community ownership, or certainly giving communities a chance to take part. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Give okay. Me Kate, now, because we've actually stretched, uh, I think, longer than I th anticipated we were going to this evidence session, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting for five minutes just to allow uh, a comfort break to take place. So I'd ask people to be back uh, at, at 10.53, if I, I can add that up correctly. So we'll suspend the meeting for five minutes.
Okay, thank you, and I'm going to reconvene this move, meeting and move uh, straight on with the remainder of the questions. I thought we got to the stage where, Douglas, you'd asked all your questions, and then on that basis, I'm going to move uh, to the next questions from Jackie Dunbar. Jackie. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I'm going to ask just a couple of questions around the lotting of large land holdings, um, especially around the f framework and processes. Um, can... Do you think that a defined statutory threshold um, can be anything other than arbitrary? And um, do you think that the lotting proposals can be designed to take account of the local context? Uh, Josh, Linda's looking at you, so I'm afraid yeah. you're first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in a sense, any kind of... Um, Scale-based threshold is somewhat arbitrary, but you know the, the threshold for the, for the transfer test of a thousand a thousand hectares is based on the commission's the land commission's recommendations. Um, if you look at the the research produced by the the land commission on land transactions, because this is you know this will apply at the point of of transfer, um, we're looking at. I think just off the top of my head, I can check in a moment, you know, eight, eight transactions at 1,000 hectare and about 17 transactions per year at 500 hectares. That's an average, so it'll obviously change. Um, but in a sense, what they're trying to do, I think, in suggesting these kind of thresholds is pick up localised issues of, of concentration of power. So in a sense, there's a solid basis to it, and we think it's a good idea. Um, the point about picking up local context and the transfer test and lotting mechanisms in general, are that the criteria or the guidance that needs to inform a decision to lot or to intervene in the, in the land market needs to be based, as I've mentioned a few times, on these public interest considerations. And those will be public interest considerations that can be applicable to the entire country, but the point is they will be interpreted in each local context because net zero may be particularly, or biodiversity gain may be particularly important in one, er one area, whereas housing may be particularly important in another. Or as Edward pointed, oh, sorry, the convener pointed out earlier, which is a very fair point, you know, if you've got a land holding which doesn't have a community in, in the local area, community sustainability doesn't work as a means of assessing if there needs to be an intervention in the land market. Whereas public interest considerations, there may be net zero, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, infrastructure projects, all other kind of things that could apply. So that's how it will be interpreted for a local context, these public interest considerations that the Commissioner, and we would like to see the Commission, making a decision based on. Linda or John, have you got anything else you'd like to add? Linda, you don't. John? Yeah, well, I was going to say, yeah, I absolutely must take into account the local context. It isn't going to work. You know, there's no one-size-fit-all model for how lots would be drawn up or any sort of mathematical kind of model that you can apply, it has to be what's appropriate in that local um, circumstance and context. But our view is that it needs to be tied to a much more effective consideration of the public interest, as it, as it was suggested in the consultation two years ago, that the lotting was really an outcome of a public interest test. And the removal of that from the bill as introduced means that the lotting bits got slightly orphaned um, and there's a, a lot of sort of text in the bill, but the objectives and operation of it are very unclear and, and, and do need quite a bit more work. OK, thank you. And how can the Lawton decisions work in the best interests of both the landowners and the local communities? Um, what, what do you think needs to change to ensure that the public interest, the human rights, the environmental issues are all considered? Uh, and do you think that they should be included uh, or considered uh, on the face of the bill? Josh, come to you. Yeah, so, so just to answer the, the last point first, I think public interest considerations needs to be mentioned on the face of the bill as part of a public interest test. You know, lotting needs to be reframed as a public interest test, one outcome of which could be lotting. John's point about lotting being kind of orphaned in the process of the bill being drawn up away from the original proposal of a public interest test with a lotting mechanism is a, is a very valid point, which I think the committee should, should look at. Um, yeah, so you'd have public interest considerations on the face of the bill and then all of those a whole list of public interest considerations in secondary guidance. Um, and a really key point about how you make this work for existing, the existing landowner 
mm -hmm. and the public interest is clarity on this guidance, which is publicly available, which everyone can access, but also by having a public interest test with a, with a lotting mechanism as a potential outcome is that it's forward looking. As it stands, we have a transfer test which is on the seller and their land holding, not on the buyer and the future land holding. So we see that it's much more forward looking. It intervenes less in European Convention of Human Rights because you have a right to dispose of land, but you don't have a right to acquire land. So intervening at the point of acquisition with, by looking at what's the, what's the incoming landowner, what's their land management plans, what's the land holding going to look like in the future, they can purchase that land but must lot 10 acres within the first six months to provide adequate, social, adequate affordable housing or to meet local need in some other way. Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to come in? No? I know, and I'm just going to blow the whole thing by asking a supplementary question. So, I um, understand what you just said, Josh, but uh, interfering in the open market value by dictating who can buy something will depress the value of the land, will it not? And will that not give rise to a claim? I mean, I've done lotting for, for years, and, and it's a bit of a black art taking into account what, what the market needs, what local individuals want, and trying to get the balance between the two. And it works very well, I think, as we heard uh, on Paclu Estates when we were there, if you know what communities and what individuals want. You're kind of suggesting that that's not the best way to do it, or did I get that wrong? So Paclu, as an example, is, is, is one, pos one positive example of, of how um, a business and a landowner with a significant amount of power and resources can do things which is very positive for a community. But then we're, we're basing that on the, on the goodwill of one landowner. What we're talking about here is setting up land reform mechanisms that can apply across the country and achieve a diversification of ownership. And there is, there is a, a potential um, intervention in the market like this might bring land values down, which in our view would be no, no bad thing because land values are, are far too high at the moment. Um, but this isn't, um, you know, an idea dreamt up out of nowhere. If you look at crofting legislation, if you're going to become an owner-occupier or, or, or acquire a tenancy for a croft, you have to live within 32 kilometres of that croft and you have to actively cultivate it. So there's means of intervening in market transactions to say actually how that person is going to manage the land and, you know, looking at things like tax residency. I know this is possibly out with the bill, but it's a sense of there's a number of land reform mechanisms but, that, that could but, but, much. but with respect, yes. the value of a croft is determined within the crofting act if you're going to buy it. Um, what we're talking about here is interfering with the free market. Now, I understand that might be your uh, way of interpreting it, but there will, be, there will be a cost, quite a substantial, could be quite a substantial cost to the government by doing that. Uh, and do you accept that could be quite a substantial cost? So first of all, just on the, the point with crofting, you know, research by the Crofting Federation, it is, it is an open market on crofts now. If you actually want to purchase it as an owner-occupier, then that is dictated, but that's why tenancies for crofts are going at several hundreds of thousands of pounds, which is a separate issue, which you probably know plenty about. But the point is that the, the bill as it stands, which is not strong enough and is not ambitious enough, is intervening in the market. What we're saying is if you're going to intervene in the market, you do it on the basis of public interest considerations, and you make sure that it actually achieves something. Because there's a risk here of intervening in the market, not achieving anything, opening up issues of uh, compensation, but also just creating work for, for lawyers and land agents, but not actually achieving the policy intention, which is land reform and a diversification of land ownership. OK, uh, I think we come at this from different angles. I'm going to go to the Deputy Convener. Thanks, Convener. Um, the Land Commission uh, recommended a public interest test in uh, applying to uh, the transfer. Uh, the government has chosen to go for a transfer test. Uh, why do you think they've taken that approach and not a public interest approach? We don't know. I mean, we've, we've seen some of the Scottish government's thinking on this, and from our reading of their rationale, it should be a public interest test. We would welcome the committee speaking to the Scottish government about why they've made that decision and how they came to that conclusion. Because as far as we can see, 
um, it not only weakens the mechanism, it opens it up to further legal challenge because the, the point of having a public interest test and centering any land reform legislation on the public interest is that is the rationale for intervention into property rights written into the European Convention of Human Rights. It's, it's, it's got a long establishment um, and precedent in, in Scots law and in UK law. It's in you know, 200 pieces of legislation already. We don't know why they've gone for a transfer test based on community sustainability rather than a public interest test based on public interest considerations. It's a serious weakness within the bill. It doesn't follow manifesto commitments that, that explicitly engage with the public interest. It doesn't follow Scottish Land Commission guidance. It's something that really needs looking at and, and we think seriously needs, needs amending. Okay, thanks. Uh, Monica, you've got some questions and then I'm going to come back to the Deputy Commissioner. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Convener, um, we've had evidence that uh, suggests that large land holdings are more likely to attract private investment and be able to deliver against woodland and peatland targets at pace and scale. So I just wonder if that's the panel's view or do you have um, a body of evidence or examples of smaller land holdings um, achieving this or working together to deliver at scale. John's probably better. Okay, John, you've been yeah. nominated. <laughs> um, yes, so it's clear that if you have a large land holding, then it, can, then it has the potential to act at scale in a way that a small land holding doesn't. But um, that doesn't mean it will happen. Um, and if we were dependent on having that, you know, these things could only happen by through large land holdings, then most of our European neighbours will be in dire straits because they're not blessed with Scotland's pattern of very large land holdings. Um, the reality is you work with what you have. There's a lot of evidence that certainly um, woodland creation and so on, it's the vast majority of those schemes are on a very small scale as it happens so far. Um, well, I'd also make the point that large land holdings are what we have, and we have a huge number of problems with um, a whole range of climate change and biodiversity issues, rhododendron, deer, peatland emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they may be a way forward and they may help, but they're not a necessity. And I don't significantly think that, I don't think that the sort of level of change that we're suggesting, even if all the amendments we're proposing were adopted would have any significant impact on those sort of that sort of climate and nature um, action. Okay, thank you, John. I think Josh perhaps wanted to come in. Yeah, just on your point about um, any examples of of kind of existing good practice of collaboration. You know, if you see the, the Northwoods partnership, which the Scottish Rewilding Alliance are a key part of, the Black Hills Regeneration Project, project on the Noidart Peninsula, which is community landowners, private landowners, crofters working together on big regeneration projects. We have examples of this, which is smaller land holdings working together and some bigger land holdings working together. Um, and the point is that when you have that kind of collaboration, you also get a greater degree of local democracy. You get more voices in the room. You get these projects delivering social, economic, cultural benefits, as well as just environmental outcomes. And I just absolutely echo everything John has said about our existing pattern of land holdings and the, the existing kind of crisis we find ourselves in. Okay, so do you think there's potential if we have more smaller land holdings that is more scope for collaboration and working differently? Yes, that's what we've seen already. And if, and if we look at the, the prospective community landowners that we engage with and our members who are community landowners, obviously each, each community landowner has their own priorities, but fairly near the top of those lists are issues around biodiversity and climate and resilience. And the local people who, who live in that place are of that place and who are going to be there for multi-generations. They're thinking multi-generationally. They're not thinking about how to secure investment or maximise investment over the next 30 years or the project delivering in the next 10 years. They're thinking about a place which is climate resilient and biodiverse for the next 200 years. So it's a much much more robust, resilient way of thinking about land custodianship rather than the existing patterns that we have in many places. Okay, thank you for that. And just sticking with this um, part of the, the bill, so we've had questions about lotting, about the transfer test and so on. Um, 
is there anything that you would want to bring to our attention today in terms of um, international um, examples or, or, or good practice elsewhere in terms of some of these, what these regulatory mechanisms could look like? Um, you don't have to answer that, but if you've got anything you want to add, this would be the time. Um, John, were you waving at me? Well, I, yeah. I, I, would, no, I know that the Scottish Land Commission has done quite a lot of work looking at international models. I think, that if I remember right, it's they looked at 22 countries and 18 of them had mechanisms to um, regulate in some way land ownership and use. And I think they made it quite clear that there's no single model that you can, you know, lift wholesale and, and just impose on Scottish conditions. We would have to work out and we will have to work out what works for us. But the, the clear thing is that actually the great majority of their sort of peer nations, if you like, have these sort of regulatory frameworks in place. And then we're the unusual ones in that we don't have it in Scotland in, in a lot of ways. So. OK, and last word on that, back to Josh. To, to echo everything that John has said and to point out some research that was done by Dr Kirsten Shields for the Scottish Government, which detailed a number of international examples, um, which, again, I can send on to committee. Um, and, and the key point, as John was saying, is, is we are the anomaly in Europe in not having more robust oversight over this. And if you look at a, a country like Iceland, which is also a signatory to the European Convention of Human Rights, has extremely, what we, what we would see as extremely stringent rules on ownership around having to be domiciled or having to be um, a citizen and then owning you know, a handful of hectares, capped at a handful of hectares and slightly larger if you're a business. And there obviously will be guidance around that for things like agriculture, but to point out that we are the anomaly and actually very stringent controls on land ownership are the norm in lots of parts of Europe. But I will send on the further research from, from Dr. Kirstine Shields, if you don't have yeah, it. Thank you. And, and the, the committee has a good relationship with parliamentarians in Iceland, a few visitors back from, from a trip there. So again, we might want to um, ask some questions of, of colleagues there. Just if I, I may, um, because Josh um, earlier on mentioned Gresham House and um, whether they had come back to the, the committee with an answer in terms of the number of jobs. So I found the, the letter from April, so they did come back to the committee in response to my question. I won't read it all out, but it's, it's a public document now, but just to, to let you know that they confirmed that Gresham House has contributed to the creation of around 200 jobs. And in terms of the issue about ownership, there's a long-winded explanation, but basically they're saying they indirectly own around 298 hectares of forestry assets in, in Scotland. Um, so, again, not directly about the bill, but I just wondered in terms of that, that level of job creation, is that how does that compare to what we see with sort of community-owned land or smaller land holdings? Josh wants to say anything yes, on that. So any, I, won't, I won't say any specific figures because I'd have to I'll look into that. I don't want to, to put a foot wrong. But I would just I would query the figure they've given for land ownership. So if they did only own 200 and something hectares and provided 200 jobs, that would be a very successful business they're running on 200 plus hectares. Um, but I think in conversations I've had with colleagues, the best way to describe the ownership patterns of Gresham House is funds managed by Gresham House Partnerships Limited own... 53,000 something hectares um, and for that amount of land holding 200 jobs it'd be interesting to know what kind of jobs they are are they seasonal um, contractors who are who are felling trees are they long-term employment um, be interesting to look at their their tax accounts things like that all kinds of things that are public interest tests not within this bill which is a point of transfer but but the beginning of a public interest test as a norm within Scottish land reform legislation that can start to look at who's actually owning land in Scotland and how are they contributing to our kind of our wider um, sustainable development? And Linda, and just to say that we will be able to provide you with details of um, community landowners and jobs created, so we can send that on to the committee. Yeah, that would be helpful, and I'm sure Clark can assist in um, pointing people to, the, to that that letter which we received in April. Thanks, Thank Monica. Uh, and then I come to the deputy convener, and then I'm going to come to Rhoda Grant, who's been waiting patiently for her questions, penultimate <laughs> questions. Uh, Michael. Thanks, convener. Um, I'm going to turn to section six of the bill, the creation of the land and communities commissioner. Do you think the government have got this right and how it's set out in the bill? 
our, our view is not, not quite, not exactly. You know, the, there is absolutely a need for a greater regulatory role for the Commission, but the Commissioner as created and set up, we have some concerns about. So we'd want to see the kind of increased regulatory powers that, that are in the Bill, and moreover that would, would be in place if our amendments were, were accepted, to actually be vested in the Commission. You know, the Commission has been set up for a number of years. It's widely respected in the sector. It has a lot of research and, and kind of policy background and will be well placed to kind of make these decisions. Um, the concern with the Commission as set up is that um, it's going to be highly, highly individual and based on the person who gets into post. And I think this is in part because they followed the model of the, the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Not an, not an area I'm, I'm an expert in, but from what I understand is a kind of a widely respected position based on the individual who's in post, but that is too subjective to the individual that's, who's in post. And the Tenant Farming Commissioner is largely a mediatory kind of function. This new Commissioner is a regulatory function, and because it's a regulatory function, it needs to be much more closely tied into the Commission. Um, and there's a number of ways of, of doing that. We've, we've set out you know, some of the wording that could be within the bill that makes it less tentative, but much clearer about how the commissioner is positioned. So things like the new commissioner must consult with the commission before making recommendations. New commissioner must have regard to the commission's policies in undertaking their work. Commissioner must have regard to considerations that the commission itself must have regard to. There's a number of, of kind of relatively easy changes to the face of the bill, we think, that could secure the commissioner into the more accountable um, body of the Commission and prevent any potential kind of discrepancies that could happen between the Commission and a more kind of independent floating Commissioner who has a regulatory function. Okay, so just so I'm clear on understanding this then, yeah. you don't believe that the uh, Land and Communities Commissioner should be a standalone Commissioner, it should be part of the Land Commission? Yes, like the, like, the, yeah, like the other Commissioners and be on the board of the Commission and, and be subject to the same kind of rules as the Commission. Okay, and Linda, is that your view as well? Position of details, yes. And John, is that your view as well? Yes, I, I would agree entirely with what Josh has said. I would add a couple of things. Firstly, that I think that the Land and Communities Commissioner should be able to initiate inquiries rather than being reactive as they're in position in the bill. And also concerns about the line in the financial memorandum that suggests that the post will be at least part funded by a reduction in the Commission's wider policy work. And that's a big concern to us because we think that's been one of the great strengths of the Commission in its time of operation. And would be, we would be worried if that was being scaled back. I mean, of course, we understand the resources are tight everywhere, but that, that would be disappointing to lose the good work that, or some of the good work that the Commission does. Okay. Uh, Josh, you mentioned the issue of enforcement. Um, uh, are you clear about what enforcement functions the Commissioner will have, and do you think that those enforcement functions are sufficient, particularly, let's say, for example, in areas such as community engagement or in land management plans? Do you think the enforcement provisions are sufficient? Um, no, so not, not as things stand. So kind of coming back to those... The penalties and associated with that, we spoke a bit about the kind of the 5,000 fixed threshold, but, but we are making the case there should be much more robust points of intervention. We've suggested that the Commissioner should have this kind of escalating scale of intervention, which would require, you know, this is one of the reasons why, in our view, the Commissioner should be more embedded into the Commission. So this would be a first stop of some kind of fine that's proportionate which can escalate up to things like a sheriff's order for a land management plan order, um, which again the Commission has oversight over, so the Commissioner would then use that order to try and enforce the production and compliance with land management plans and community engagement. And this is also the point at which cross-compliance could come in, which John mentioned earlier. And then there'd be a third and final point of escalation, um, which essentially would be the trigger for a public interest test. And this would probably be over a couple, a period of years of, of lack of compliance with proper kind of oversight um, and proportionality built in. But the key point being that a land management plan that doesn't have any kind of um, robust regulatory mechanisms and also doesn't have the ultimate backstop in extreme cases of, of mismanagement and lack of engagement with these public bodies to have a means of changing ownership. And so actually, if we had a public interest test as opposed to just a transfer test, a public interest test could be applied in extreme circumstances if a land management plan 
has, has not been engaged with over a period of years and, and orders and cross compliance have all been ignored, there has to be a means of changing ownership. Okay. Do you think the, uh, the enforcement provisions for the Commissioner should be based in statute? As opposed to guidance? Um, it's a good question. The level of detail that I have just gone into, some of that should be in guidance, but the level of um, the, the potential powers that the Commissioner would need to have, I think it would be helpful for some of that to be in statute, because it's, it's, a, it's more of an intervention. I'm more inclined for some of the detail of that to be in guidance, because it would need to be more worked out. I'm happy to send you further, further detail on, on the kind of specific amendment and changing of the face of the bill that would encapsulate all of this. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that. I'm taking from what you're saying, it's more the principles of enforcement that's important in having the statute. But actually, the practical application of that is probably best dealt with in guidance. Yeah, the practical application is definitely best. Yeah, it gives you more flexibility yeah. if it's not working properly. OK. Uh, my final point is uh, in relation to the disqualification criteria that's set out for the uh, Commissioner. There's a provision uh, within Section 6 that says that a person is disqualified from this role if it's not, this is not reading from the bill, but it basically does, it's basically it's, they're disqualified from the role if they've been the owner of a large land holding in the preceding year. Do you think that threshold's sufficient? John's looking away so I can come in again. I'm aware I've been speaking a lot. I don't know if John wants to come in. But in, in essence, something like that is, is sensible. But a provision like that becomes less important if the previous suggestions that I made are implemented and that commissioner is more embedded into the commissioner and accountable to the commission rather than having this kind of slightly um, ambiguous floating position which will be more dependent on who that individual is. Because by the same token, you know, significant private landowners could say, well, what if it's, you know, a, a prominent land reformer? who then applies for that position and gets it. So it cuts both ways. So it's good to have some kind of, um, if, if, if as it is, it isn't changed, it would be sensible to build in some kind of disqualifications like that. But a more robust way of doing it would be having that commissioner much more accountable to the commission. And then the decisions that they're making will be informed by the commission, not just their own experience. So my reading of what you're saying to me is, unless there's other John or Linda want to contribute to this, John. Um, no, I was looking. So I was looking away because I wanted to check what it said in the bill. Sure. And yeah, it's a sensible thing, but as Josh says, I think you manage it better by restructuring how the Land and Communities Commissioner sits in relation to the broader commission, rather so than thinking about how best to do a job you know, person spec for that person. Yeah, so my, my reading of what you're saying is that you think the threshold of disqualification is sufficient, but the risks associated with the issue of potential conflict is better managed if the Commissioner is based within the Land Commission. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's fine, thanks. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, but surely the legislation is written that the Land Commissioner <laughs> sits within the Commission, but he has special he or she has special skills. So it's still in the Land Commission. It's just that those powers aren't shed, spared out or shared out with all the Land Commission in the same way that the Tenant Farming um, uh, Commissioner is a member of the Land Commission, but his work on tenant farming is his uh, within the Commission. So I, I'm, not un I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. So I don't think there'd be any need to, to limit the specialism of someone. It would be good to have someone who has, a, who has a specialism that would be helpful for particularly things like lotting mechanisms or public interest considerations. It's about changing. The wording within the bill is very vague about the relationship between the commissioner and the commission. And using some of the terminology that I've just suggested and which is in written evidence would be a way not of, not of spreading the powers of the commissioner around the commission, but of making sure that in making their decisions, which will be regulatory and interfering in the property market, they're doing that with proper um, reference to the existing work of the commission, because that isn't there already. Oh, I'm not sure I, I, I see that, but, but I'll, I'll reflect on what you've said. Because I need to bring in Rhoda Grant, um, who's got some questions. Rhoda, you've waited very patiently. The, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. I've got um, some questions on a theme and then maybe some supplementaries on evidence that was given previously. So uh, bear with me if I appear to be dotting about a wee bit. Um, Firstly, I would want to talk about um, or ask about urban land reform because of the way land is defined um, in the bill, it means that urban land reform really can't happen under this bill. So I wouldn't. I would like to ask the panel what's the benefits of having land reform extended to urban areas and how it could be done in practice. Now, I, I can only see two witnesses here because, uh, there we go, uh, I can't see if John is looking away or, or looking at, at the camera. But Lin Linda, I think, is going to kick, kick off. Were you yes. going to kick off? I mean, I, I, I do think that it would be vital that the bill picks up urban land reform. I mean, I think we've touched on the challenges for communities in urban communities around about vacant derelict land, kind of just access to space, kind of significant assets. And that includes public assets as well. Um, I think there are challenges with the legislation across community. There are challenges with the legislation open to communities and urban communities round about the community right to buy. And I think it would be very helpful if there were other mechanisms available to communities, particularly in densely populated urban areas, that they can access land, be that within this bill or or other legislative routes, be it compulsory purchase or compulsory sale orders or the, the reframing of the community right to buy provision. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with what Linda said. I think there's been a long, now a relatively long standing Scottish Government commitment to, to land reform being a, a nationwide issue affect, affecting rural and urban since the 2015 Community Empowerment Act. The, the, the rights the, the land, existing land reform rights have been extended to urban communities, so it seems a shame, missed opportunity, an error for them to be missing from this bill, um, because urban Scotland, as Linda just detailed, faces like very particular issues which could be picked up by this bill if we pivot from talking about large land holdings to significant land holdings, and if we start thinking, as we've discussed at some, some length, I think, which hopefully is, is clear for committee around sites of community significance and this more kind of proactive discretionary criteria for communities, which could mean things like community engagement obligations, land management plans could apply to very significant um, areas of urban Scotland which are not being managed well, which are subject to land banking and absentee landowners. Um, so it could be a, a way of not only potentially changing the ownership, but also seriously reforming the land management of, of areas which are blighting urban Scotland. Rhoda, back to you. I don't know if John has something to add. Not a lot to add, but, um, you know, really backing up what's been said, I think it's essential that we have a unified kind of land reform process that covers urban and rural, because actually the division between them is quite arbitrary. And it certainly isn't captured by thresholds of either population size or area. So this sites of community significance idea is absolutely critical um, to bring the urban realm and even the you know even the very small villages and small towns of Scotland into the into the picture and allow them to have the opportunities that might be provided for remote rural areas. Okay, thank you. Um, there was discussion about a public interest test, and that seems to fit quite well with this. What, what's the implications of our divergence from kind of that internationally recognised test? What, could, what could effect could that have on this legislation? Well, in, in our view, it, it opens up the legislation to, to more legal challenge and lack of clarity rather than building upon existing legislation in Scotland and elsewhere. Um, for urban Scotland, it also brings up challenges. So if, if the bill did apply to urban Scotland, these sites of community significance that could be brought up, which a public interest test could apply to, as it stands, because the transfer test is so focused on community sustainability, there may not be a valid argument about community sustainability for that particular site, say a vacant and derelict site in Glasgow. However, there may be very pressing public interest concerns about why that land should be owned and managed in a different way. And in a sense, 
the government is shutting off ways of reforming ownership and management in really productive ways by focusing in simply on community sustainability. And obviously that seems like an odd thing for, for a community land organisation to be saying, but there is a, there is a limit um, to the legislation by just focusing on communities. You know, the public interest considerations in relation to land are far more broad and very important as well. So there's, there's, there's kind of two issues. There's the potential for legal challenge and there's the real kind of um, missed opportunity um, for, for further land reform, more expansive land reform that brings in pub public interest considerations. And the, and the real point underpinning this for committee is we're very unclear as to why this decision has been made and would really welcome committee kind of interrogating that. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm at a slight disadvantage. John, did you want to come in? No, nothing to add to that. Josh has covered that very adequately, superbly. Okay, thank you. Um, there was some discussion about knowledge of land transfers and how communities could register their interest in land. I wonder what the panel's view is making land transfers and sales much more transparent. Should that be available publicly so that if a community does have an interest, they can then register that interest? Should there be an obligation on landowners or la owners of land of community significance to always do that transparently? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we agree that that's needed and that the, the kind of mechanism for actually having that notification should be as, as broad as possible. Um, and that might include local organisations, but also perhaps going to relevant national stakeholders who, who can make sure that if there are any local relevant groups, they, they are notified. There is a process that in place, let's say, for Forestry and Land Scotland, um, who quite frequently sell large or small areas of land for various reasons, by which they um, notify not only local organisations, but national stakeholders. Um, I would, you know, with all these things, they're never quite perfect, but they work pretty well. Um, and I think that's essential. Um, you say, at, at, at hopefully a lower threshold than exists at the moment. And I, ju I just add to what John was saying that absolutely agree. The transparency mechanism within the prior notification is very welcome. And whatever the threshold is decided at, greater transparency for transfers over those thresholds or applying to those thresholds is incredibly beneficial. And that's not just for communities and communities who, who might, might want to own, own land or particular assets. It's transparency that works for anyone who might want to engage in the land market, be that a company, a business, a other individual and the point if we're trying to achieve it to get back to the, f the foundational point of diversifying land ownership greater transparency is absolutely vital for that so that a whole range of organizations and people can engage in the land market okay thank you thank you convener uh, thank you very much uh, i think that comes to the end of the qu uh, questions i've got a very simple one at the end um and uh, I think whenever I come up with a wish list of all the things that I'd like to do, um, what tempers it at the end is the, uh, the thought of how much it's going to cost. So, Josh, you wave, uh, wave a magic wand. Everything that you want put in the bill goes into the bill. What's it going to cost Scottish Government? So that's a good question. Um, So we've had a look at the financial memorandum and spoken to the Scottish Government about this. Um, so there's obviously, I think, as John has spoken about, there's, there's a resourcing implication, f implication for the Commission around this new, the creation of this new Commissioner, and we would not want to see the other functions of the Commission diminished. So there does need to be proper resourcing of that. Um, I think we've spoken a little about the potential cost implications around land management plans and the need for some support. Um, so the... The financial memorandum as set out kind of details some of this, none of which we see to be a particularly um, punitive kind of um, cost. There is further working out somewhere in our evidence of the likely financial implications of changing the thresholds, which I will send on to committee um, directly. Um, and on the point of um, compensation, 
so th th that is a risk from, from government intervention. We haven't seen a huge amount of conversation paid out for what were much more radical land reform bills in 2003 and 2016. Um, in the financial memo, the Scottish ministers are the kind of the, the final buyer if there is a, an intervention that goes wrong. And if there's a public interest test in which a buyer can't be found, the Scottish Government may have to purchase. But they are purchasing an asset, not a liability. They are purchasing land, as and they own lots of land already. Um, and there's a potential for the government to kind of resell it at a profit. So there, that, that isn't putting a specific figure on any of the, the points that we're talking about. But, you know, we're in active conversation with Scottish Government about the possible financial implications of this, none of which we see to be punitive. If we also start to see um, land management plans with the kind of escalating penalties that we're talking about, there is a, a means of some revenue coming back in as well. Um, so that's the long answer. The short answer is I'll send you our workings out. Uh, I look forward to seeing them and I look forward to seeing whether the Scottish Government agree with you um, uh, as far as the costs, uh, because I'm sure that will have driven some of their proposals within the bill. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, that's quite a long evidence session, but extremely uh, worthwhile. And uh, we're now going to move into private sessions. So if I'd ask committee members to stay in their seats, we're going to crack on, if we may, please.